Well, first off, uh, Vim, as I was uh, saying earlier, uh, I'm old enough to remember when you and Werner and Foss, uh, Werner Herzog and Fassbender were, you know, you were all the rage. It was the ger- the new German wave. Uh, this is back, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And I was wondering, mm-hmm. given that, that's why it's a real treat for me to get a chance to, uh, to meet you and uh, talk to you. But I was wondering if you could go back to that time, if you could have envisioned a movie like Pina, which is what we're uh, going to be talking about mostly today. Does it fit your aesthetics back in back in the day, what you're doing with Pina, or is it a completely different animal? Not in my wildest dreams would I have envisioned a really three dimensional film. Oh no. And about dance? Oh, forget it. <laughs> so what's what changed in the intervening thirty or forty years? Well I I I was one of these guys who really weren't into dance at all include me out and um, I seen some classic ballet and some modern dance but it I, it wasn't my cup of tea I just didn't have the taste for it and and that all changed one day in the mid 80s and one summer night in Venice Italy when my girlfriend of all things wanted to take me to a double bill of two pieces by Pina Bausch and from the poster I guessed it was dance and I said no <laughs> Venice, Italy, there's lots of good stuff to do. Right. But, of course, I caved in, and it became a night that changed my life and that moved me to tears. I actually cried through the entire night and did not know what hit me, but I knew this was big, and I had just discovered something phenomenal. And and that's why I wanted to make the movie, too, and wow. for a long time, because I felt more people... Like me, who said dance, include me out, should should be introduced to this beauty and this language that is so universal and so healing and so simple and, and wonderful. Yeah. So why, if this was back in the mid-'80s, why did it take you all this time to do this then? Because they didn't show up earlier. And I didn't know that I was waiting for that. I mean, Good I was enough. just wrecking my brain how to how to fulfill my promise because I told Pina let's make a movie together it was my own bloody idea and then she eventually picked up on it and then she started pushing and said Vim you've been talking about it for so long let's do it and that's when I get in, got into trouble because that's when I realized <laughs> it was one thing talking about it and then if you want to make a movie you have to get a handle on it and you sit down and imagine it and write it down and write a concept and I couldn't I realized I did not know how to film dance, uh, and in particular, penis dance, because uh-huh. which is still a, another story. And even the history of dance films didn't really help me. I looked at everything in the book, and I realized there was something like a general problem between film and dance, and my craft wasn't good at it. And I didn't want to disappoint penis, so it took 20 years of hesitating and stalling for time, and each time she said, Vim, are you ready now? I said, not yet. <laughs> Give me more time. Give... Until I've one day, out of the blue, found the solution. I didn't find it in my own heart. It was in a new technology. 3D, boy, I remember. I saw some of that stuff, Hitchcock and stuff, when I was a kid. And I remember the headache it caused. <laughs> right. More than anything else. Yeah. And it sucked. And it, it wasn't an option. And I never, it never occurred to me in all these years, these 20 years, when Pina and I tried to conceive of a film, it never occurred to me that what I was missing was the third dimension, and, but that's what it was. So it was the technology that you were waiting for that you didn't realize that. So can you explain, right now, 3D, you know, it's been kind of a stunt, and but recently some really top-notch directors, yourself, and we mentioned Werner Herzog, but also Spielberg and uh, Scorsese have come out this year with 3D. Has something changed about the technology of 3D, or do you guys now see it in a different light? Talk to me about the significance of 3D for you. Well, I mean, when I first saw it, and that is five years ago, my initiation was a uh, concert from U2 3D. Hmm. That was in the early days, precursor almost. I was convinced from the get-go that this was a fabulous new language and that it had this unbelievable affinity to dance. This was this was invented to film dance in my book. Uh. And the two of them would complement each other and, and really get out the best in each other. And then 
the first 3D films came out and it seemed to me like it got out on the wrong foot, hmm. the whole technology, and everybody started to think it was made for animation. And of course, there are marvelous things done in animation, but now we really believe that it was a tool for live action or documentary. And the first films, and we all got used to the idea that it was linked to rather to blowing up things and to action and blockbuster movies and I think in the eye of in the eyes of the public it was reduced to that all of a sudden and it took a while until it slowly sank in that maybe this is an instrument that is not only good on different on faraway planets but also on our own planet so do you think the success of avatar helped or hurt the development for you the artistic development of 3D I'm eternally grateful to James Cameron that he made the film because we shot most of Peanut before Avatar came out. It was Christmas or nine. And yeah. until Avatar came out, everybody thought I was playing crazy. <laughs> 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 you want to shoot a dance film in 3D? Oh, yeah. And then Avatar made us look respectable. Ah. And, uh, and it really put 3D on the map. And out of a sudden, people thought, well, maybe... For them is doing is not so completely off the planet. So can you explain to us uh, who Pina is, what the significance of her is, you know, um, in the dance world um, and for you? I mean, what's sort of what's her standing? She was a true revolutionary and pioneer, and she single-handedly reinvented dance or hmm. put it upside down or in my book, rather on its feet, and gave it back to common humanity and took it out from being very much an aesthetic experience that you had to know about and that you had to have a taste for to something that belonged to humanity, and that was a common human language. And she from she turned it from an aesthetic experience, maybe for some uh, privileged people, into a very understandable, easy and almost existential thing that everybody speaks, you can see it. Yeah. I took very tough cookies into seeing penis. Real men who who would otherwise see sports and would tell me, Vim, is this really serious? You're gonna take me to an evening of dance? You can't, you must be kidding. I took these guys and after 10 minutes, I looked at them and they, they were crying. Yeah. So do you think dance is like the universal language? And one of the interesting things is among her dance uh, troupe, all these dancers speak all these different languages or their their thoughts do. How German is Pina Bausch? Well, her ensemble is not German at all. There's a couple of Germans in there, there are 36 dancers. But yeah. they're really from all over the world. And I counted, they speak all together 18 languages. In the film, we reduced it to eight. Yeah. They're the, from all continents. But do you think she has a specifically German uh, sensibility in I any way? I think so. You think I so? Think so? I think so. Pina is, there's is something utterly romantic about the approach and there is something German and something very un-German as well. Yeah. I mean, she's, there's a lot of humor in Pina's work, which is probably the un-German part. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's, she was a very courageous woman when she invented a whole new language and dance theater was something that just didn't exist before yeah and it wasn't theater and it wasn't ballet and it wasn't mono dance it was something altogether different she got a lot of resistance the first couple of years there were doors banging and people shouting they even called the police when she, with the first performances and then after a while the people of her own town started to love her and embrace her and then then it became something that conquered the world you know, are, how similar, are you more similar to Pina or different? One of the things I thought was remarkable, her, her dancers talk about how cryptic her directions were. It's a, you know, well, you know, do keep searching or be crazy or tell me something I don't know. And I noticed, I remember Peter Falk talking about uh, you during uh, Wings of Desire, that you gave these kind of general ideas and he just sort of, you know, winged it and, and at times things hit and times things didn't. Do you think you have, do you have the same sensibility as Pina or are you guys two different birds? I think we both have a similar attitude towards actors. And Pina's 
dancers are all actors and there are other actors who are dancers. And that is a condition in order to work with Pina. You have to be both. Hmm. You have to be a great dancer and a great actor. And I think we both expected our actors, or do, do expect our actors, not to, not to disappear behind the character and sort of show us how fantastic they can, they can um, Lose not themselves. be themselves. Yeah. But actually, I expect my actors to reveal themselves and to expose themselves and to show us who they are. And Peter was fantastic at that. Peter appeared as Peter Falk, and Peter was one of these fearless actors who were, was really thriving on improvisation. Huh. And most actors are scared shitless <laughs> of improvisation, really. Yeah. And, P- and Peter was fantastic at it. And that's why he played the part in Wings of Desire to begin with, because he said, when I called him, and we were already in the middle of the shooting, and I explained to him I had a part that wasn't written, and it was a late addition to the script, and he laughed his heart off and said, and accepted. I mean, he didn't know who I was, and accepted it because he said, I did my best work this way. Huh. Getting into an adventure like this and starting a part that is not written. I mean, we wrote it together on a weekend when he arrived, and then shot for several weeks, and it was one of the highlights of my life to to work with somebody who was so comfortable in, in improvisation. You know, that, that makes a lot of sense because he made those John Cassavetes films. Do you see any similar... I've never I've never thought of Vim Vendors and J- John Cassavetes in the same thought process. Do you think you guys are similar at all? Uh, yes and no. I mean, John's procedure was different, and he, and he shot while they were improvising. Yeah. And... I use improvisation as a method to elaborate a scene, and then when we're shooting, we know something about it. Yeah. Pina used improvisation in a very different way. Hmm. She had her a method that was totally unique, I think, in the dance world as well as anywhere else. When she conceived of a new piece, and she created 40 pieces every year, and the one it was always a work of several months, she knew what she wanted this to be about the the context but she didn't invent a choreography that she then showed her dances she mm. developed a catalog of questions around the subject lots of questions detailed personal general questions and she asked each dancer a question and he or she would not be allowed to answer with words just with movement and dance and she would look at it as if it was a statement, as if it was the answer to a question. Actually, it was the answer, except it was a dance answer. Hmm. And she would look at it and say, oh, well, that was lame. <laughs> or, or that was very much a cliche, and you can be more personal and show me something more precise. And, and she continued to ask these questions for days, and they worked on the answer, and she tried to get to the core and really tried the dancer to answer that question in the most profound way possible. And they worked on that for a month, and then she had a treasure of a 100 hours of answers that were all dealing with the issue that she wanted to make this piece about. And then she selected two and a half or two hours of that, and that became the piece. Mm. So the piece itself came out of people. It it wasn't sort of imposed on people. And Mm. that's why it's also so touching, and that's why it concerns people, because... They recognize themselves. Mm. And almost, it's hard to fathom. She died just days before you guys went, started filming? Or at least well, originally planned? What? Yeah. How? What? That must have it been was, devastating. What was that? It was a tragedy because after talking about it for 20 years and then preparing for two years and finally being ready to shoot it, and then she passed away really literally from one day to another, unforeseen. Nobody knew it. Nobody said goodbye, neither her family, nor her dancers, or us, the film crew. And she was just gone from one day to another. And that was, of course, the unimaginable. And and I was so shocked, I just pulled the plug on the film and said, Basta, finished, can't do it anymore, and walked away. And there is only a movie now because the dancers did not walk away. Hmm. They actually performed the night that Pina died in tears, and soon afterwards decided to stay together as a company. And then, a few weeks later, started to rehearse the very four pieces that Pina had put on the agenda of the company. 
And that's when it dawned on me. Maybe this was the last time they were ever going to do this. And how excited Pina had been by the two of us inventing, applying this new language to her dance. And it dawned on me that maybe we we couldn't make the film with her anymore. Definitely we couldn't make the film mm -hmm. with her anymore. But maybe there was a film we could make for her and that film could also be a way to say goodbye and thank you and find a way to deal with the loss. And that's what we then did. And I, I'm sure you've... Uh you have imagined this. How do you think, what would her reaction to this movie, this particular movie, be, do you think? Oh, I ask that question every day, with every shot. I, because we had been working on it so closely in the preparation that I felt she was looking over my shoulder every day. Hmm. And with each scene and every, with every setup, I really had to ask, answer that question to myself. How would Pina like it? Is this good enough, Pina? Is this what I promised you? And did we take too many liberties here or so? Mm. So I had to answer the question, and I only knew when the film was finished and I showed it for the first time to the dancers. And the way they reacted to it, it was a very cheerful event because none of them had seen Pina or heard her voice ever. That was a year after her death. So, and then I knew we had done something right. And, and, I realized she was sort of smiling at us. You know, it occurred to me, um, again, we've mentioned Wings of Desire a couple of times. I've read, actually, that you thought that Pina kind of helped inspire how you approached Wings of Desire. And it occurred to me, you have all of these interviews with these um, dancers, but they don't speak. You just hear their voices. And it, w it reminded me of the angels in Wings of Desire, where they're, you don't see people speaking because they're thinking, but the angels are aware of their voices. Is there mm -hmm. any kind of a you know connection there, or is that just sort of... Accidental. There is a very simple connection I stole from myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a brilliant place to steal from. I I promised Pina from the get-go when we were working on this film for 20 years that I wouldn't do a single interview. I promised her because mm. she hated interviews. And she hated to interpret her work or talk about it. So when I made the film with the dancers, I never thought of doing a single in interview. And when I edited the film, in my book, it was a silent film, only music and the dancing that would speak for itself. Hmm. And, and well, it towards the end of the editing process, I realized it was a little too cryptic, as you mentioned it. Hmm. And especially pe people who didn't know about Pina needed a little more, to know a little bit more about the relationship with the dancers and how her work had had happened and stuff. So... I remembered that I had all these talks with the dancers, with each and every one of them for hours while we, when we started working together in order to know how they had gotten to know Pina and when they started and how they had found out a bit about Pina's particular method of working. And so I had all these long talks on a crummy tape recorder and <laughs> I listened to them and I took little pieces and put them over their silent portraits and realized that it could work if they were, in a way, like the thoughts that the angels hear, the interior voices of people. And I asked them to re-record these pieces that I had liked. So it's their own, it's their own thoughts, but re-recorded, and wow. and that's how we did it. And I kept my promise: no interview. Yeah, that's great. Um, you mentioned that Wings of Desire. I've been lucky enough to have visited for, um, Berlin for a couple of weeks in the past decade, and I was wondering, that that Berlin almost doesn't exist anymore. Um, I know you have a love for Berlin. How, what's your take on Berlin now, more than 20 years after the fall of the wall? I moved back to Berlin five, six years ago after living in Los Angeles for a decade, and I love it very much, and it's it reinvented itself in a amazing way it found a way of how two different cities from two different planets could actually become one yeah there's a house across uh, around the corner from where i live and it has a huge graffiti spread over it and it says this house once stood in a different country <laughs> and this is true. that that's the magic magic of berlin that it's two different planets are yeah. now one city and it it's a very lively and beautiful city, and a lot of musicians and painters and young people from all over the world have located there because not only is it really thriving, it's also one of the most affordable cities in Europe. Yeah, 
That's pretty poetic graffiti. As graffiti goes, that's pretty poetic. Yeah, I love Berlin. I'm a, I'm a huge Parisophile, but I, I, my spending my time in Berlin, there's there's no more exciting city on the planet right now, I don't think. I stand that. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, um, I know your Pina is um, honored with an Oscar nomination, and I, I'm wondering, when you're an artist like yourself, do you value award shows and things like Oscars uh, personally, or do you kind of scoff at that kind of a... Uh, Awards giving. I wouldn't lie if I would pretend that I'm not excited. <laughs> yeah, good. Being nominated and that the work that we did together resulted in such a recognition and actually resulted in audiences worldwide really act, reacting very emotionally to the film, which is, of course, the greatest re reward of all. But I'm... This is only the second time in my life I'm nominated, so it's a big thing for all of us. Half of my crew is coming on their own cost to Los Angeles. They just We just couldn't stop them from traveling there. <laughs> That's a great. Well, it's an absolutely gorgeous film. Good luck to you. Thanks. Um, uh, it's a, a, a week or so away from now. and uh, It's Sunday in a week, yes. Yeah, Sunday in a week. Yeah. So you'll be, uh, oh, will you be, uh, do you have your tuxedo and all ready to go? I didn't get a new one. I have one. <laughs> yeah, okay. Very good. Thanks a lot, Vim. I'm Thanks, really uh, happy to have uh, got a chance to meet you with you. And Thanks good a lot. Good luck at the Oscars. Thanks.